Good evening, and welcome to the webinar, Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers, Practical Guidelines for the Selection of Disease-Modifying Therapies in Multiple Sclerosis. The speakers will discuss application of these guidelines in the rapidly changing MS treatment landscape. This webinar is accredited for continuing education by the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers. This program is supported by educational grants from Avenir Pharmaceuticals, Biogen, EMD Serono, and Sanofi Genzyme. Tonight's learning objectives will be identify frameworks for therapeutic decision making for disease modifying treatment of relapsing remitting, progressive, aggressive onset, and pediatric multiple sclerosis. Determine rationale for switching therapies for patients with MS to optimize disease management based on individual efficacy, safety, and tolerability needs and discuss recent changes and ongoing challenges associated with MS treatment, including decisions about starting, stopping, and escalating therapy. We will include time at the end of the presentation for audience questions. You may submit a question at any time via the web by using the Ask a Question feature on the left side of your screen. The webinar cannot accept questions via phone. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Corey Ford is Professor of Neurology and Director of the MS Specialty Clinic at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center in Albuquerque. And Sarah Morrow is Associate Professor of Clinical Neurological Sciences at Western University and Director of the London Multiple Sclerosis Clinic in London, Ontario. And their disclosure statements are shown here. Thank you both for joining us. Dr. Morrow, we'll start us off. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening to discuss the guidelines, uh, the CMSC guidelines that were published in early 2019. Uh, the group met in 2018, and this was chaired by myself and Dr. Corey Ford, and experts from across North America were invited, and it uh, culminated in these guidelines that we're going to discuss today. On top of that, we're also going to discuss uh, how things have changed since the guidelines have been published, as of course, as new medications are uh, added to the landscape, there will be differences in treatment guidelines. So today we wanted to talk about how to apply the treatment, goal, uh, treatment guidelines for people with MS, to talk a little bit about what's changed since that time, as well as discuss some key issues and challenges in terms of disease-modifying therapy and multiple sclerosis. As shown on this slide, we will be discussing relapsing MS, as well as highly active MS, progressive MS, and switching treatments between medications, as well as pediatric MS, and a small bit of pregnancy, which is quite common in our patient population. One of the things that we discussed at our, at our consensus meeting was the fact that we preferred the term relapsing MS versus relapsing remitting MS. And we felt that this better reflected the fact that in between relapses, there is no true remission, that there is no true disease quiescence in between relapses, that even if they are not having clinical activity, there may be development of new lesions, new T2 hyperintensity lesions, uh, which are a marker of inflammation. And there's also more and more studies with high-frequency MRIs demonstrating that there's ongoing uh, destruction that we cannot actually see with the MRIs and may not be causing any symptoms at that time. The other uh, one move we wanted to make was to move away from clinically isolated syndrome and rather lump that into early MS. The reason is, is that really those who fit a true clinically isolated syndrome who already meet dissemination in space likely will be progressing onto MS uh, in terms of dissemination in time. And thus, we felt that this was better to put it in a continuum rather than putting them into separate boxes. As of August 2019, we now have available interferons, which include betaseron, rebif, avonex, and plegridi. We, of course, have tecfidera and obagio, our two uh, daily uh, oral treatments, as well as mavenclad, which has been available in Canada for a while, but newly available in the U.S which is an oral therapy as well, which is given as an injection therapy, and of course our infusion therapies, which include Ocrevus, Tysabri, and Lemtrada. Uh, 
So a poor, I apologize, I came too early on that slide. So one of the things that we talked about during our guidelines and we've discussed in the guidelines themselves is that as soon as there is a confirmed diagnosis of MS, there is good evidence to show that treating early means that you're going to, ha you're going to prevent irreversible damage. So you really want to start a treatment as soon as possible after an MS diagnosis, as we currently don't have anything that reverses the damage or, ca or can lead to remyelination. Of course, any of the approved therapies can be considered as an initial therapy, depending on the individual. One of the things we did not want to get stuck on is what is available by FDA or Canadian guidelines in terms of old terminology of first and second line therapy. We didn't feel that this was appropriate as some of the ones that are deemed second line, either in, in either country, may be an appropriate first line therapy in certain patients. Additionally, there may be a time when you want to go from one of the higher efficacy therapies to one of, of the drugs that are considered first line therapies if you are de-escalating or perhaps changing for safety reasons. So we didn't feel that there should be any limitations in what should be recommended in the initial therapy for patients who are newly diagnosed with MS. One of the difficulties with treating MS is that you can really only determine if a medication is working for a patient, if a disease-modifying therapy is efficacious, by giving it a trial. There are no trials which indicate that the drugs are effective in every MS patient, and thus it needs to be done in an individualized way, balancing both efficacy, safety, as well as patient's preference and patient's lifestyle. We want to remember that we need to consider what breakthrough therapy means, um, that you may want to move to a different therapy, usually a higher efficacy therapy, such as an infused monocle therapy at that time. Next, we're going to talk about the newly approved therapies. So first is Mavenclad or Cladribine. It has been available now for almost two and a half years, I think, in Canada, and thus we have quite a bit of experience with it. It is administered in a similar pattern to Lemtrada and is thought to also be an induction therapy similar to Lemtrada, whereas it's given in two treatment cycles, uh, one year followed by the second year. Unlike Lemtrada where it's given over a week, it's given for one week and then a month later another week. This seems to be uh, good for patients with an inadequate response or poor tolerance to other MS therapies. It is slightly different from Lemtrada in that it targets both T and B cells and is taken up into the cells and prevents them from replicating, and thus there is not an immediate destruction of the T, T and B cells. That means that the lymphocytes come down more slowly and often don't go quite as low as what you see in lem Lemtrada. You do sometimes see it go as low as 0 0.4, 0 0.5, but in clinical practice, we have not seen the same amount of immunosuppression that you've seen with Lemtrada. To date, there doesn't seem to be any secondary autoimmune issues of course, it is still early in the course of this approved therapy, and sometimes these do appear after they're being used clinically, but certainly there does not seem to be that same risk that you see with Lemtrada. I'm now going to pass it on to Dr. Ford, as he's going to talk about some Potamod, which is not yet approved in Canada, but is approved in the U.S., and thus he has more familiarity with it. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So moving on to uh, the drug saponamode, which was uh, recently approved in the U.S. for at least some secondary progressive indications, the first drug ever for that, uh, the FDA decided that uh, the efficacy appeared to be higher in those who had evidence of disease activity, and therefore they approved it as an S1P receptor uh, modulator for all forms of relapsing MS from clinically isolated syndrome or early MS to uh, relapsing forms of secondary progressive MS. The study was a large one. It was over 1,500 patients. They had EDSS scores at baseline between 3 and 6.5. And the maintenance dose of the drug is generally 2 milligrams uh, with a dose tri titration needed to reach that. However, uh, one of the issues in the use of of saponamode is that uh, patients have to be tested for certain CYP, uh, this is a metabolizing enzyme for the S1P drugs, to find out exactly what phenotype they have. Uh, those with uh, phenotypes uh, labeled as uh, 1 slash 3 or 2 slash 3 
uh, will get um, a one milligram dose uh, as opposed to the full two milligram dose. And those that have the so-called three slash three phenotype, uh, the drug is contraindicated. It's also contraindicated for those who have active heart disease or significant cardiac rhythm abnormalities. So in addition to the usual outcomes of relapse rates and EDSS and MRI changes and cognitive measures, the primary endpoint was uh, clinically uh, definite progression over a three-month period, and that showed a 21% decrease for the drug compared to placebo. And that's why we now have it for consideration in active secondary progressive MS. In the guideline, we talk about the, the concept of NIDA, or no evidence of disease activity, which is a therapeutic target that you see used more frequently, especially as a clinical trial endpoint. It is a a finding that can be quantified by uh, no progression of disability, no relapses, and no changes on MRI. However, you know, in the real world, which this guideline attempted to uh, focus on, uh, reaching NIDA is uh, somewhat unrealistic, and, and no studies have yet demonstrated that you can reach NIDA for the majority of patients over prolonged periods of, of time. So in the guideline, we actually uh, use the term MEDA, M-E-D-A, minimal evidence of disease activity is a more attainable and realistic expectation for the, for the use of the disease-modifying therapies. So with that definition, uh, a patient on a drug who is doing well but has a small or minor new change on MRI or a mild uh, sensory relapse that recovers well and quickly, you might consider not changing the drug at that point but continue to follow and monitor. So the question then comes up, where do we stand with NIDA? Do, do we have a higher standard for what we uh, consider acceptable disease activity? And the answer to that might be yes and no. Uh, we have more drug options with different mechanisms of action, and so I think we do have the opportunity to make changes uh, when warranted, but none of the drugs yet really cure MS, and so most patients are going to have some signs of activity, either clinical or MRI, over time, and therefore you know, changing the drug still requires uh, some application of uh, clinical judgment. Uh, we don't want to run through all of our treatment options uh, and uh, make it more difficult to continue treating this group of patients that show some changes. Another concept uh, that's come up is the question of whether Treatment approaches to patients with MS should follow an, an escalation uh, strategy or uh, start with what some people call an induction strategy, um, escalation being you're starting with safer, potentially lower efficacy drugs and then moving to higher ones as uh, patient activity dictates. And the other approach uh, would be starting with uh, an induction drug, something that you might consider more aggressive, um, typically associated with more adverse event possibilities and side effects in order to try and get the disease under control and, and then following them from there. Um, again, uh, the expert committee, uh, the, the, uh, the panel that put these guidelines together thought that the optimal disease-modifying treatment management would be based on a number of factors and uh, individualized for patients. So in making this decision whether to start with a drug and escalate or start with an aggressive drug, you would be thinking about their clinical condition, uh, their degree of disability when you're seeing them, coexisting diagnoses. Uh, for example, do they have JC virus that might change treatment, diabetes, uh, kidney disease, and other uh, comorbidities that could affect your initial choice. And the reality is that a significant fraction of patients with MS do have relatively mild uh, disease and it's relatively easy to treat, at least uh, initially. Uh, providers you know, might approach women interested in starting or expanding their families in a different way and uh, the drugs that are safer uh, tend to fall into that uh, you know, lower efficacy or at least considered lower efficacy group. Um, it, it's important to remember that when those drugs like uh, glutaramoracetate and interferon were uh, 
first tested and approved, they were tested in groups of patients who were anything but benign uh, by our current standards. They had many relapses. They had uh, significant amounts of disability and MRI changes, and yet, uh, you know, the drugs did have efficacy and, and were approved. The type of patient we see has changed a bit over time, but uh, it's important to remember that uh, in a given patient, any of the drugs could end up being uh, the right one for them. And this, this slide now just goes into a little more detail on these concepts of escalation and induction, uh, where escalation, again, uh, starting off with safer, potentially less potent therapies, and then escalating as needed, or induction, you know, starting with uh, a drug hoping to induce a disease remission, although, again, that's a, a difficult target. Um, when you say that you're inducing, you, you have the implication, I think, that you're going to use the drug for a temporary period of time or a limited period of time and then change to something uh, that's possibly safer or to continue over the long term. Uh, when you're escalating, uh, you, we do remember that the disease course is heterogeneous. You're considering relapse frequency and severity and recovery, as well as MRI activity. Uh, remembering that many patients do do well on the injectable agents, and uh, there is a study uh, cited there that 70% of patients who started uh, early on interferon betas had an EDSS less than three by year 11. And then the question is, well, what percent of patients have what we would, might consider a benign course. If you define that as an EDSS less than two, which is mostly signs and not much impairment in any uh, activities like walking and function, at 10 years, uh, some of the literature indicates that that number may be as high as 20%. The problem you face is it's hard to tell when uh, one patient is sitting in front of you whether they're in the benign group or the aggressive group, and, and that, of course, uh, complicates your selection process. Uh, if you're going to start with induction therapies, uh, for example, alemtuzumab or the B-cell depleting drugs like ocrelizumab or um, autologous or uh, hematologic stem cell transplants, uh, you have to remember the potential long-term biological effects, uh, some of which have yet to be uh, completely delineated. Remember that uh, NIDA is not achievable for all patients on any drug, and that includes those high-efficacy drugs. And uh, some patients uh, achieve need to have less active initial disease. You know, in other words, maybe they didn't need the induction. So, again, uh, the guideline uh, says standard MS, meaning you know, relapses that recover well, um, or you know, not a high burden of disease on MRI, you can consider uh, early treatment with one of the injectable or oral drugs and then escalate. Uh, for that subgroup that has highly active MS or uh, risk factors uh, for disability, then maybe starting with one of the higher efficacy therapies, if, uh, if it can be approved, uh, could be the right way to go. So the answer is uh, it can be either way and be acceptable. Sarah, back to you for uh, relapsing MS. Perfect. Thank you. One of the things we thought was important to discuss in our guidelines was not just initiating a therapy or switching a therapy, but also how to monitor disease response or disease activity. On top of clinical activity, which is, of course, very important, uh, any relapse really indicates that you need to discuss uh, whether the drug is the appropriate one for that MS patient. But MRI activity is also a good Mo uh, monitoring is a good way to monitor whether there's been some disease activity that could potentially be better controlled with a different therapy. After starting a medication, we all felt that we should follow the CMSC MRI guidelines, which endorses that you should do a baseline MRI three to six months after starting a new disease-modifying therapy. This will, of course, vary based on the mechanism of action of the drug and how quickly the onset of action is expected as well as what's available based on your region. Perhaps an MRI may not be accessible that quickly, and for some medications, of course, it may take three to six months to have full efficacy, and you might want to wait until that time to re-baseline your patient. Similarly, we also wanted to follow the CMSC guidelines in terms of when to follow up MRIs on these patients, and we really did feel that every six to 12 months initially was appropriate. 
What might differ is whether there was activity on the last MRI, perhaps something that wasn't too concerning at the time, but should there be continued activity, you might consider a six-month rather than 12-month MRI. Or for people who may be stable, you may want to choose a 12-month MRI. It may also vary based on the risks of the medication. Certainly those who have high risks of PML, it might be uh, a good idea to do an MRI every six months to ensure that there is no activity that would indicate PML uh, has uh, not yet caused any clinical symptoms. Other things you might want to consider in terms of frequency is anything else that may indicate a change in the activity, such as a relapse. You may want to see what other, what other activity is ongoing, whether there's other silent clinical, uh, silent, clinically silent lesions on MRI, as well as something else that might suggest changes, such as an increase in disability or new symptoms that may not fit truly with a relapse, but again fits in what we were saying earlier where there's no true remission in between relapses. We also felt that this really applied mostly to those who are on new therapy, who are on a therapy newly. So those who have just started a new therapy or those with high risk. Certainly someone who may have been on a therapy and been stable for many years uh, may not need an annual MRI, perhaps every two to three years or with one of those red flags we discussed earlier, such as changes in their symptoms or a relapse would suggest that an MRI should be done but otherwise, we felt it doesn't necessarily need to be done yearly after perhaps two or three years of disease stability. We also felt, again, in keeping with the CMSC guidelines, that we should move away from the routine use of gadolinium. This is due to the evidence that there is gadolinium in, uh, deposition in the deep gray matter structures in the brains of people who, in which it's used routinely. And there was a recent publication that showed that people with MS who received gadolinium more than five times, so five MRIs with gadolinium, were already showing the de deposition of gadolinium in the basal ganglia. Since any new T2 lesion represents disease activity, we really felt that gadolinium was not needed on a routine basis. It can perhaps be used in certain cases, such as a new diagnosis where you want to see if there is dissemination in time, both lesions with or without gadolinium enhancement, or perhaps someone who has not had an MRI in a while, but you're concerned about disease activity, and thus seeing many gad enhancing lesions would indicate that there is a need for treatment or a different treatment. Of course, just as uh, we discussed earlier with things changing since the publication of our guidelines in terms of medications, there are going to be new CMSC MRI guidelines. The conference uh, to discuss and update on these guidelines are, is actually this Friday. And the biggest issue that's going to be discussed is barriers to routine implementation of these MRI guidelines. We want to switch gears here and talk about what to do in highly active multiple sclerosis. Uh, as mentioned previously, the approved high efficacy agents should be considered as initial therapy if there's someone who has poor prognostic factors that indicate a worrisome uh, prognosis. So someone that you are worried about because they haven't recovered from their relapses or the high burden of disease on MRI diagnosis or perhaps many new lesions despite being on a treatment or at baseline. Most of the high FAC agents are monoclonal antibodies at this time. There is some debate about the available oral therapies in terms of high efficacy. Certainly, fingolimod and saponimod and clagibine are considered to be high efficacy agents based on our expert opinion. But there are not many head-to-head -head trials that support that uh, data other than retrospective or large database studies. At this time, we do not recommend the use of mitoxantron for patients with multiple sclerosis, even in the secondary progressive phase, due to safety concerns, and certainly with new medications available that can be used to treat these, uh, the, uh, these progressive patients, it would certainly not be warranted to use a medication that is at high risk, such as mitoxantron. I thought I moved the slide and I did not, I apologize. The risk with the high efficacy medications mean that there is more safety monitoring. It is someone where you need to see more frequently, educate them about the potential adverse events or risks, 
so they know when to contact you or the MS clinic to address any potential adverse events. We are recommending that hepatitis B and C, as well as tuberculosis, HIV, be ruled out before starting on a medication, uh, as well as ensuring they are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, reactive. Whether they choose to get vaccinated for hepatitis A and B is a personal choice. It is not uh, mandatory, but it's something that should be discussed, as once the medication is started, it would not be, they would not be able to be vaccinated with hepatitis A or B. But you certainly would not want any uh, smoldering infection that would be uh, revealed by starting a high efficacy medication that lowers the immune system. Additionally, with the anti-CD20 agents, specifically ocrelizumab or rituximab, which is also used in some areas, we would want to continue with annual IgG and IgM uh, to ensure that you are not making them completely immunosuppressed. Of course, we can't talk about safety without discussing PML risk because that is one of our most feared complications, especially with uh, natalizumab, although it is also being seen with other high efficacy drugs currently. Um, we don't think that natalizumab should be excluded for patients even if they're GCD positive. Of course, you need three risk, uh, you need two of three risk factors in order to develop PML. And one is uh, being JCD positive, another is prior use of immunosuppressants, and the third is being on natalizumab for 18 to 24 months. Plus, if someone has never been on an immunosuppressant before and the the uh, platform medications, including the injectables, um, as well as the oral medications are not considered immunosuppressants, uh, then the, really the two risk factors would be JCD antibodies and duration of therapy. And thus the risk of PML in that first 18 months is quite low. This is an excellent figure and I often refer to it with my patients when I'm discussing PML risk, especially those who are JCD positive and we want to talk about switching therapy. We do talk about the risk, uh, both the absolute risk as well as the severity of the risk. Because although the numbers might be slow, uh, certainly PML can be devastating and fatal if not caught early, unless it does need to be considered as one of the risks of high efficacy therapies and needs to be monitored. We did, as a group, the consensus committee did feel that if a patient still converted to JCD antibody positive status and had been on natalizumab 18 to 24 months, that there should be some discussion about switching the therapy or other options. One thing that is currently in studied, being studied is whether extended dosing natalizumab does decrease the risk of PML, and that data will be quite helpful for us to make clinical decisions on our patients who are JCD positive and on natalizumab. Corey, I'm going to pass it back to you. Okay, thanks. So we're going to shift over now to a discussion of uh, progressive MS, starting with the primary progressive MS. And uh, we now have uh, disease-modifying therapy that uh, was approved for that. Now, the diagram on the right side of this slide uh, shows the potential uh, clinical course of uh, primary progressive MS, and it can be somewhat complicated. Uh, just moving from left to right, uh, you see the uh, red bar showing active uh, per, uh, disease, uh, meaning there was a relapse. So that little arrow uh, on the x-axis there is meant to show a new uh, MRI lesion suggesting activity, and yet uh, clinically the patient is just uh, slowly progressive. Then the blue bar shows uh, a period where things are not active and there doesn't seem to be progression, so that we would call stable. And then the green bar again showing uh, uh, progression but no signs of activity, meaning the MRI is stable and there haven't been a relapse. The next uh, red section uh, shows uh, another way to have activity. Uh, some patients with primary progressive MS will in fact go on and have a first relapse, and that would certainly count as activity, even though the rest of the picture may be dominated by progression of disability. And then uh, to the right of that, uh, the, the last uh, light blue bar shows activity, but the disability is stable. So even though there's uh, two little arrows suggesting new MRI lesions, uh, those are not associated with any uh, signs of uh, clinical progression of disability. So th that's the way it, things uh, can look. And 
Uh, we now have aquilizumab, which was uh, the first disease-modifying therapy uh, that we have approved for the indica indication of primary progressive MS. Uh, the question then comes up, well, if you're treating patients with the PPMS, then uh, how could you or should you use the MRI as a monitor? And that becomes a little controversial uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there's no consensus about what uh, significance uh, MRI changes might have. And in a situation currently where we really have a one drug approved, it's, there aren't a, a lot of uh, alternative decisions to make if you do see changes. Um, on the other hand, uh, to me, it does make sense at some level to interpret an MRI change if you see it as uh, activity. Um, and then you must also remember that uh, you typically would do a brain MRI to follow up patients, and yet in primary progressive MS, particularly uh, changes in uh, lesions could be in the spinal cord where you might not always repeat a scan. There has been a, a trial of uh, aquilizumab, which is approved for PPMS here, in secondary progressive MS that uh, was not positive. Uh, but they did notice something interesting, and there was a gender discrepancy in the outcome of the data uh, that showed slowed disease progression in men, but not in women. Um, and that didn't affect this panel's recommendations for the use of the agent. Uh, this is actually historically consistent. Uh, if you look back at the uh, Glutirmer acetate primary progressive trial, uh, when they subdivided the data, and this was a negative study, it uh, did not lead to approval of uh, glutirmer acetate for primary progressive MS, but when you pulled apart the uh, enrolled subjects into men and women, again, the men showed a uh, relatively significant looking uh, slowing in the progression of disability, but the women not. And when you combine the two, then uh, the study was uh, a failure on the primary endpoint, and, and that's uh, the way that played out. So um, it is interesting that uh, there could be some differences in treating men and women with uh, progressive MS, and um, that we need to get more data to work that out. So uh, although the criteria for the in enrollment in the clinical trial of acrolizumab and PPMS was age uh, 55 or less, this panel does not consider that to be uh, the age limit for eligibility for therapy. So uh, we don't think that uh, clinical trial criteria are, should be used rigidly as uh, decision data for who to put on a drug and who not. There are other factors. And uh, ocrelizumab, as with all drugs uh, in progressive forms of MS, do seem to work better if there is evidence of uh, disease activity in the patients, uh, typically that would be MRI activity. So the group that has some MRI activity or activity or that you would label as active uh, tend to do a bit better than those who don't have that. And then the question comes uh, with secondary progressive um, and perhaps primary progressive MS after a uh, considerable period of time, you know, when do we stop MS Do we or stop uh, disease-modifying therapy? Do we ever do that? Um, so a couple of points. Uh, MS rarely burns out or stops. It may be very slow, but when you look at pathological studies at almost any stage of the disease, you typically see at least some areas uh, of inflammation throughout the disease course. And so the possibility remains that uh, the drug that it really, it may not have been approved for progressive forms of MS, but was started during the uh, relapsing phase, is still having some benefit. Uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, for those who are stable and well-controlled on their disease-modifying agent, it's advisable to keep them on that, because if they're, if they're not having MRI activity or relapses, it could be because the drug's working, that's what they do. Uh, once you're well transitioned into the secondary progressive for, for some years, it gets a little uh, more difficult to determine. And the flow chart on the right on this slide is showing some uh, ways that you could think about identifying patients that you could consider stopping the drug. So, you know, most of these will be secondary progressive. Typically, that's associated with an uh, older age group, say greater than age 60. Uh, their evolution of disability suggests that they're at an advanced uh, neurodegenerative stage. Uh, they may be quite disabled. Uh, they're not having ongoing relapses. Uh, 
And if you do the MRI, you're not seeing uh, any obvious uh, changes in T2 or contrast-enhancing MRI lesions. And, and so you know, it's reasonable to ask and, and to consider the possibility that they could discontinue the drug and, and the potential risk that could go along with the uh, use of some of these drugs. However, um, if you've ever dealt or asked your patients with uh, this kind of advanced MS, whether they uh, would be willing to stop the drug and you think it's okay, they uh, often resist that and uh, they would like to continue on with the drug. So again, uh, I think you're in a clinical judgment situation and uh, you'll deal with your patients uh, one by one. Another issue that uh, can sometimes uh, come up is this, and I mentioned it briefly, is the issue, issue of de-escalation. You're starting with this uh, so-called induction strategy. I, I actually don't like that word, but it's used uh, with the implication being that you're going to do something to uh, take the immune system uh, down and, and uh, stabilize it with respect to MS, and then consider switching to something safer for longer-term treatment um, with a better a drug with a better safety profile. Um, if you do do that, um, patients who do discontinue drugs or change drugs should certainly continue under medical supervision with clinic visits and possibly imaging studies to, to detect reactivation of the disease. You, know, you assess periodically whether the agent that they're on remains the best option, um, and that's not just true of uh, progressive forms of MS. That's certainly true for all patients. And uh, for those who... Uh, have, uh, you want to minimize the risk of disease activity during a treatment switch. If you decide to change drugs, you want to consider having a very brief or even no washout period. There's uh, uh, significant risks to stopping some agents uh, acutely, which we'll get into a little bit. So now I'm going to talk about uh, when to think about suboptimal response to the current therapy when you might consider switching the disease-modifying therapy. This is a graphic from our guidelines, and there'll be another graphic on the next slide that also talks about the same issues, just in a different format, depending on which one uh, appeals to you. But these were just some red flags that we felt would indicate that you should consider there may be a suboptimal response to the current therapy. So of course, uh, one or more relapses in a year would always be considered something uh, that might indicate there is sub suboptimal response. Of course, it may depend on the severity of the relapse as well as the location of the relapse. Those being spinal cord relapses may be more concerning. Should there be development of two or more two T2 lesions in a year or one GAD enhancing lesion in a, in a year, this would be considered something where you would consider whether this is suboptimal response. Uh, any relapse with poor recovery or permanent disability may indicate that a switch is needed. Uh, of course, one relapse does not indicate disease, uh, that the disease is not being controlled by the drug, but of course, with a severe relapse with accumulating disability, you would want to try your best to prevent another one as they will only accumulate disability with another relapse suffer that doesn't fully recover. And then finally, any subjective worsening, subjective or objective worsening, I should say, worsening of disability, whether this be um, increasing fatigue or not being able to walk as far or other things that you find in the neurological examination. And the reason that this is important, despite perhaps not having um, lesions associated with it, is that you may not always see MS lesions, especially with uh, 1.5 Tesla MRIs or even three Tesla MRIs in the spinal cord or even in the brain, as sometimes a small lesion can cause a lot of issues depending on the localization. Now, one thing to keep in mind when I say these should make you think about suboptimal response is we're not saying that all of these mean you should because, of course, um, as we were talking about earlier, we're thinking about NIDA, minimal disease activity, not NIDA, no disease activity. And that's simply because if you were to switch for one small change with any of these suboptimal response, you may cycle through all the medications unnecessarily and have fewer choices. You also have to keep in the context of when you started the medication and whether it's become uh, efficacious or therapeutic at that time. Uh, you don't want to consider a time when you're ramping up a drug in order to get to the full dose or full uh, efficacy and consider disease activity during that time as an indication of suboptimal therapy.
In this next slide, uh, we're talking about the same uh, idea, but looking at uh, a little bit more detail, not just in one year, but a little bit further along the line. So you really want to see that there's been a change when they're on disease act when they're on a drug in terms of disease activity. You want to see that there has been a change in the relapse rate. Um, that would always indicate that the drug is perhaps not being fully efficacious. If they're having a frequent relapses, even if they're not every year, you may want to consider that um, ongoing relapse activity does indicate ongoing inflammation and indicates that perhaps a different medication would be more efficacious for that individual patient. Although uh, the trials and certainly our clinic exam is very heavily weighted towards physical function as well as what's found on neurological examination or what you might um, do in the EDSS, we did feel that other uh, ancillary tests were just as important in indicating that there may be suboptimal response. So changes on the time 25 foot walk, there is excellent data showing that a 20% increase on the time 25 foot walk indicates that there's been a progression, as well as cognitive testing. Again, there is a good evidence that a four point decrease on the SDMT or symbol digit modalities test does impact uh, them clinically. And of course, other things such as something having an effect on their employment or their quality of life. Again, MRI, you always get worried if there's more than GAD enhanced, many GAD enhancing lesions in that first year. This may be one area where you might want to consider using gadolinium at the one year mark, especially if you are unable to rebaseline the patient with an MRI in order to ensure that there is no ongoing activity or if there is, that you may want to consider a different medication. Again, this table is in our guidelines and you can reference it by, uh, by looking at the guidelines themselves. Here we're looking at uh, switching the therapy if they've had a relapse. So now focusing just on that one indicator of disease uh, activity, specifically relapses, and that's important because really it's our best clinical marker of disease activity or inflammation, and certainly that was what was uh, targeted in all of our clinical trials, especially the early ones. So the first is, and we somewhat uh, alluded to this before, is that you want to think about them well, you want to consider relapses only after you consider the medication to be efficacious. So if they have a relapse during the uh, induction phase of perhaps Tecfidera, where you're coming up on the dose, and then you may want, want to consider a relapse during that time to indicate that it's suboptimal therapy. Uh, you may want to consider whether they've been adherent to the medication. You don't want to just think that the medication isn't working because, of course, if they're not taking it, it's not going to work. So you may want to evaluate the adherence to the medication. And you may also want to consider repeating the MRI to see whether there is other clinically silent T2, T2 lesions indicating not just one new lesion causing this relapse, but other uh, ongoing disease activity markers that you may prompt a switch. And it may also help direct which medication you want to switch to. Um, you also want to consider that we don't just change for efficacy, but we also change for safety. So if there's a factor limiting their ability to take the medication, such as increasing liver enzymes or immunosuppression or perhaps um, intolerability, because of course if they aren't going to take it, then it's not going to work, you need to take that into consideration as well. When you're switching in between therapies, the washout ther period has been a point of contention. Certainly when the interferons and glutarimer acetate first became available, there was a big push that there should be a three-month washout in between medications. As we learned more and more about the medications, we learned that we don't necessarily need a washout with those medications. With the newer medications and the higher efficacy or those who, that modulate the immune system even more or even have the immunosuppression, that's become, again, an issue that we need to consider when you're doing a switch. You need to think about uh, labeling increases, uh, labeling issues such as with vengolimod or natalizumab, where you may see a disease rebound after stopping the medication before starting a new medication. So really, we do recommend in our guidelines that this should not be more than 12 weeks uh, because there may be some changes uh, that would occur that you could prevent by switching them, by preventing this rebound. Um, if you're not able to switch, for example, with fingolimod, if there is ongoing lymphopenia that should be monitored frequently, such that is both making sure it's safe to switch the medication, but also trying to minimize the time without medication on board to minimize any disease activity. 
With uh, interferons, glutrimer acetate, and dimethyl fumarate, there seems to be no need to do a washout period, of course, unless there is an adverse event that needs to be addressed, such as decreasing liver enzymes or increasing the lymphocyte count before you start it. And then, of course, in pregnancy, uh, we did recommend um, that certain medications are safe should they choose to become pregnant may not continue during pregnancy, which Dr. Ford is going to talk about a bit more, but consider teriflunamide that you should be checking for pregnancy when you're seeing your patients because it can remain detectable in the serum for eight, to two, eight months to two years in the clinical trials, as was shown. So you really want to keep this in mind if either thinking ahead, if they're planning on getting pregnant, switching them to something else, or making sure that teriflunamide is washed out as soon as they discover that they are pregnant. And okay. at this point, I'm going to turn over to, to Corey again. I'm going to go back one to uh, just a brief uh, summary of uh, pediatric MS. And the monograph that you see there on the right-hand side of the slide was prepared by uh, some, the same experts who were on the panel that uh, created these guidelines. And you can get this from the Consortium of MS Centers. I think you can probably get it on the website uh, and download it if uh, you see pediatric uh, patients with MS. So given the potential for a progressive disability and neurological impairment, uh, the panel recommends treating people, children with MS as early as possible to limit long-term neurologic damage in them. And, of course, they have an even longer period of time to accumulate disability than adult onset MS. Currently, uh, fingolimod is the only uh, disease-modifying therapy that's been approved by the FDA. Uh, for pediatric MS, and that in that study was 10 years of age and over. But the, the reality is that uh, if you talk to the, the peds neuro uh, experts, they use all of the disease-modifying drugs in children with MS, and uh, some of that, of course, this is off-label, but uh, they do find that they are effective and that they are tolerable in this population. Um, the choice of therapy here, you know, needs to take into account the child's stage of psychosocial development, their family relationships, their access to care, uh, their and follow-up, of course, and the potential for adhering to the drug, which uh, can also be a problem in the younger uh, patient group. The next uh, slide here is uh, summarizing uh, recommendations for use of disease-modifying therapies during pregnancy. Uh, safety. Uh, these drugs in women with MS before, during, and after pregnancy is, is somewhat controversial, uh, primarily because it's never been studied, uh, although there are some uh, cases uh, or numbers of cases that have been collected in some of the older drugs. Most of the guidelines or many guidelines recommend stopping the drugs before planning pregnancy and uh, recognition of an unplanned pregnancy, but of course that potentially uh, increases the risk of relapse uh, during the early stages of the pregnancy or until they get pregnant. So for women, it may be beneficial to remain on their disease-modifying drug up to conception. And sometimes even during the pregnancy, uh, a major exception to that would be teraflunamide, which uh, inherited the uh, teratogenic uh, rating that its uh, sister drug, leflunamide, had. Um, so that's definitely not recommended. It does have uh, potential for uh, teratogenic effects, in, at least in animal models. Uh, there have been sufficient exposures of both acetate in women who are pregnant, as well as interferon, uh, that uh, it seems reasonable to assume that there is no signal for teratogenicity. Uh, for that reason, uh, glutaramoracetate has frequently been picked for women with MS who have active disease during pregnancy or uh, are planning to become pregnant and need to be on a drug uh, up to and perhaps even after they become pregnant. Now, recently, the FDA did uh, put out a labeling change for the interferons and in saying that the majority of observational studies of pregnancy in women exposed to the interferons did not identify any association with uh, increased risk or birth defects. So these two drugs then uh, become potential options for women uh, for whom you have concerns of MS disease activity uh, in that setting. And then uh, this is the, the final slide. This is actually a, a graph from a figure from the uh, guideline itself that goes into some details of 
disease-modifying therapy use uh, before, during, and uh, during pregnancy. Um, so, you know, going across all the different drug categories, as we mentioned, for on the left, uh, glutarimiracetate and interferons, not necessary to stop prior to the pregnancy. No washout is recommended, and uh, they can remain on either of those. Um, if needed during the pregnancy, if uh, activity is uh, significant and a concern. And of course, glutaramiracetate is the only one of the disease-modifying therapies that carries uh, the old category B uh, for use in pregnancy. Uh, the oral agents, fingolimod and dimethyl fumarate, uh, the, the recommendations uh, in the package inserts and stuff is for a two-month washout with fingolimod and no washout with dimethyl fumarate, which course, has a very short half-life. Um, with the uh, problem we know about with potential MS disease uh, relapse and um, rebound with a prolonged washout of a drug like fengalimod, I think it, you have to back up and reconsider that recommendation um, and you know, decide whether if you do stop it, whether you're going to start something else, say uh, glutaramiracetate or interferon or another drug uh, that might be considered safe to protect the, the women while they're in that uh, stage uh, pre-pregnancy and maybe the early stages as well. None of the oral agents are recommended for use during pregnancy or during breastfeeding. Uh, natalizumab is uh, very interesting. It could actually be considered for use in pregnancy in cases of highly active disease with high relapse risk. Um, and if it is continued in pregnancy, uh, it's necessary to monitor the fetus for mild to moderate thrombocytopenia and anemia that can exist after delivery. So uh, I've not done that myself, but uh, there are uh, expert centers where, where that drug has been used in uh, high-risk women with a uh, pregnancy. Um, alemtuzumab and acrolizumab, uh, the B cell and B cell T cell uh, therapies, uh, it's best to stop those four to six months before conception if possible. Uh, you know, sometimes that can be planned. Uh, for teraflunamide, again, it is a pregnancy category X and uh, should be excluded. Uh, if for those women who become pregnant while they're on the drug, uh, the recommendation is for the uh, rapid uh, drug elimination with cholestyramine or activated charcoal to get the levels down to uh, as low undetectable levels as quickly as possible. So I think those are the highlights of the guideline that we wanted to go over with you. And I'm going to turn the program back over to our moderator and let her see if uh, any of you have any questions or uh, points you'd like to discuss. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in with us. OK, thank, thank you, Dr. Ford and Dr. Morrow, for an excellent discussion. We have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, we're going to start with a question on NIDA. Are you starting to see more patients who meet criteria for NIDA now that we have more effective therapies available? Um, Corey, yeah, I can I let you feel that since, yeah. Yeah, no, I think we do. Um, uh, but, you know, that's a relative increase um, in, in those. Uh, that, that's the ideal outcome, and I, I think some of the newer agents uh, take us farther down the road. But um, when you look at them seven years in one publication, 10 years in another, uh, the numbers of patients who are able to sustain that uh, no evidence of disease activity gets rather small. And uh, that's why I think uh, probably it's not in and of itself the best therapeutic target to have in mind when you're uh, trying to decide what drug to put them on and whether to um, maintain that drug or change. Okay, uh, so the next question that we have is, do either of you base treatment decisions on factors such as race or family history in addition to the patient's MRI findings? I can start with that one if you'd like, Corey. Uh, not so much a family history, although um, it depends, I guess, what you mean by family history. If you're talking about family history of MS in terms of other family members who have had MS, I would say no. Uh, there, the studies actually indicate that even with family history of MS, that the course of a family member with MS does not influence, does not seem to influence the course of their family member's MS. So you, although one may have very aggressive MS, another person in the family may not. So that part doesn't. Uh, 
Where family history might come into play is if you have someone who is at risk in terms of certain adverse events. So perhaps someone who has a high risk of diabetes, you may not consider certain medications. Um, and uh, or else in the in the case of ocrelizumab, I'm certainly avoiding it in patients with a family history of breast cancer in females. Although that's a theoretical risk, it is since there are other therapies available, it is something I discuss with them. In terms of uh, race, certainly um, I worry about uh, people who are non-white, so those who are of uh, African American, or in my case, African Canadian, or uh, anyone who is Caribbean Canadian. Um, we know that they tend to have a more aggressive case of MS, uh, and I find the same with those who are of Mediterranean descent, that they tend to have more aggressive MS. Um, and not so much about race or, past, or family history, but I do get concerned about my male patients because they do, uh, do tend to have more aggressive MS. Uh, Corey, was there anything else that you consider? Um, no, I think uh, that's well said. Uh, you know, the, uh, the family history thing is, you know, there's, there's obviously some genetic load uh, going on there that you might inherit from one or both parents, but uh, that does not seem to be associated with, uh, in an obvious way, with the outcome that uh, would help you uh, make a treatment selection. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question uh, that's coming from the audience. Um, for a patient who has no changes in EDSS over one year, but has two new lesions on MRI, uh, do you believe that that warrants a change in therapy? Uh, it does not indicate what therapy the patient's on, but uh, what are your thoughts? Oh, maybe. <laughs> Again, we use the MRI. <laughs> We're looking to find evidence of silent disease activity. So what's being described here is a patient who clinically appears to be doing well, and that's obviously uh, something of high importance. Uh, maybe the greatest importance of the patient is not having more disability and relapses, and so that's not happening. But then your follow-up MRI shows some new lesions. Well, uh, for me, I think the question is, then is, uh, I think as uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, uh, how big are they and where are they? Um, are, if they're in the cervical spinal cord or other parts of the spinal cord, I may be more worried. If they're um, small, you know, one, two, three millimeter kind of uh, lesions in um, non-eloquent areas of the uh, cerebral uh, white matter, I m might be willing to pass. But often they are willing to pass and say, well, let's follow. We'll be doing another scan down the road. Let's um, Let's play this out and see what happens over time. Um, Sarah, what's your strategy? Oh, that it sounds almost the exact same as mine. I, my answer would have been maybe as well. Uh, it's in that gray zone where it's not no activity or low activity, but it's also not in the high activity because their EDS is stable and it's only two lesions. Um, the, I, my strategy would be uh, two things. One is I'd probably repeat the MRI in six months. So, because if there continued to be more disease activity in six months, then that would indicate that there's something going on. The other is to consider other markers of change that are not incorporated in the EDSS. So, are they having significant new fatigue? Um, are there new, um, is there new cognitive impairment? Are there mood, new mood changes? Um, is their walking slower? Are they able to walk less of a dif distance? Uh, or is their time 25 foot walk longer? All those would perhaps tip me towards switching, even if they were otherwise not having relapses and their EDS was stable. But the fallback is always repeating the MRI to look for other uh, new lesions. Right. And one other thing I would add is, um, you know, after, after you see a lot of patients, you'll encounter some who uh, you'll tell them that, well, your MRI showed a couple of changes. They're small. You might show them and review it with them, and they'll say, I really like this drug, and I don't want to stop it, um, I, and I know there's some risks. I, I just want to keep on this drug, and we can follow up later and make a decision down the road, but not today. So uh, that's another possible outcome. Absolutely. Taking the patient into account is very important. Okay, so we have time for one final question, and uh, that is, uh, why doesn't the guideline make stronger recommendations for use of specific drugs based on disease and patient characteristics? I think because, and Corey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's no one perfect way to treat MS patients. Every person with MS is different, and everyone has a unique story, both from their MS and their personal story. And that's 
plays into the disease mod- disease modifying therapy choice that we can't say that there's a, one perfect way to treat a certain type of patient because there is no one type of patient. Even someone who has a very aggressive disease may say, I don't want to take those drugs because I'm not I'm concerned about the risk. So we we would not want to force that patient to do something that is not uh, is not in keeping with their with their autonomy. Um, similarly, it may be that you think the disease is aggressive, but the the woman says, "But I want to get pregnant in the next three to six months." So you may not go to a higher efficacy therapy for that reason because you're worried about the safety of getting pregnant. So. This was meant to be a practical guideline. That's it is called a guideline for that reason, uh, rather than um, a forced choice, kind of like a decision tree. Because I don't think you can do that. There's there's no way to come up with something that applies to every person with MS that you're going to see in clinic. Uh, Corey, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that uh, very well said. You know, uh, MS is just not the kind of disease that. Uh, lends itself to a, a cookbook kind of approach. Uh, the patients are so varied, and the treatment are, are, treatment options are uh, getting more extensive, and the, the, the side effects and other things can be very different in different people. It would be nice if we had uh, something akin to a, a blood pressure target or a hemoglobin A1C that we could uh, t- shoot for, but we don't yet. Um, maybe someday soon we'll have those kind of biomarkers, but uh, for now I think it's just a great opportunity to uh, enjoy being a physician with a, a close interaction with uh, your patient with MS and try to reach the best uh, uh, mutual decision for treating their disease. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have tonight for questions. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for being part of this program. This concludes the webinar. You will now be automatically directed to the program evaluation to receive continuing education credit. And this webinar will be archived on cmscscholar.org. If you would like to receive a copy of the published guideline, there is a checkbox on the evaluation form. Thank you, everyone, for your participation.